Tradition, or the native divine impression on human nature, dictates to them that man was not born in a state of war. And as they reckon they are become impure by shedding human blood, they hasten to observe the fast of three days, as formerly mentioned, and be sanctified by the war chieftain, as a priest of war, according to law. While they are thus impure, though they had a fair opportunity of annoying the common enemy again, yet on this account they commonly decline it, and are applauded for their religious conduct, by all their countrymen. Indeed, formerly, when the whole combined power of the French and their Indians was bent against the warlike Chickasa, I have known the last sometimes to hazard their martial virtue and success, and to fight three or four companies of French Indians before they returned home. But the leaders excused themselves by the necessity of self-defense. They have no such phrase as the fortune of war. They reckon the leader's impurity to be the chief occasion of bad success, and if he loses several of his warriors to the enemy, his life is either in danger for the supposed fault, or he is degraded by taking from him his drum, war whistle, and martial titles, and debasing him to his boy's name, from which he is to rise by a fresh gradation. This penal law contributes in a good measure to making them so exceedingly cautious and averse to bold attempts in war, and they are usually satisfied with two or three scalps and a prisoner. It has been long too feelingly known that instead of observing the generous and hospitable part of the laws of war and saving the unfortunate who fall into their power, they generally devote their captives to death with the most agonizing tortures. No representation can be given so shocking to humanity as their unmerciful method of tormenting their devoted prisoner. And as it is so contrary to the standard of the rest of the known world, I shall relate the circumstances, so far as to convey proper information thereof to the reader. When the company returns from war and comes given their town, they follow the leader one by one, in a direct line, each a few yards behind the other, to magnify their triumph. If they have not succeeded, or any of their warriors are lost, they return quite silent. But if they are all safe, and have succeeded, they fire off the Indian platoon, by one, two, and three at a time, whooping and insulting their prisoners. They camp near their town all night, in a large square plot of ground, marked for the purpose, with a high war pole fixed in the middle of it, to which they secure their prisoners. The next day they go to the leader's house in a very solemn procession, but stay without, round his red-painted war pole, till they have determined the fate of their prisoners. If any one of the captives should be fortunate enough to get loose and run into the house of the Archimagus, or to a town of refuge, he, by ancient custom, is saved from the fiery torture. These places being a sur. Asylum to them if they were invaded and taken, but not to invaders, because they came to shed blood. Those captives who are pretty far advanced in life, as well as in war gradations, always atone for the blood they spilt by the tortures of fire. They readily know the latter, by the blue marks over their breasts and arms, they being as legible as our alphabetical characters are to us. Their ink is made of the soot of pitch pine, which sticks to the inside of a greased earthen pot, then delineating the parts, like the ancient Picts of Britain, with their wild hieroglyphics, they break through the skin with garefish teeth and rub over them that dark composition to register them among the brave, and the impression is lasting. I have been told by the Chikasa that they formerly erased any false marks their warriors proudly and privately gave themselves, to engage them to give real proofs of their martial virtue, being surrounded by the French and their red allies, and that they degraded them in a public manner by stretching the marked parts and rubbing them with the juice of green corn which in a great degree took out the impression. The young prisoners are saved if not devoted while the company sanctifies themselves for their expedition, but if the latter be the case, they are condemned and tied to the dreadful stake one at a time. The victors are first stripped their miserable captives quite naked and put on their feet a pair of bearskin Maccabees with the black hairy part outwards. Others fasten with a grapevine a burning firebrand to the pole, a little above the reach of their heads. Then they know their doom, deep black and burning fire, are fixed seals of their death warrant. Their punishment is always left to the women, and on account of their false standard of education, 
They are in no way backward in their office, but perform it to the entire satisfaction of the greedy eyes of the spectators. Each of them prepares for the dreadful rejoicing, a long bundle of dry canes, or the heart of fat pitch pine, and as the victims are led to the stake, the women and their young ones beat them with these in a most barbarous manner. Happy would it be for the miserable creatures if their sufferings ended here, or if a merciful tomahawk finished them in one stroke. But this shameful treatment is a prelude to future sufferings. With the death signal being given, preparations are made for acting a more tragic part. The victim's arms are fast pinioned, and a strong grapevine is tied around his neck to the top of the war pole, allowing him to track around about fifteen yards. They fix some tough clay on his head, to secure the scalp from the blazing torches. Unspeakable pleasure now fills the exulting crowd of spectators, and the circle fills with the Amazon and merciless executioners. The suffering warrior, however, is not dismayed. With an insulting manly voice, he sings the war song, and with gallant contempt, he tramples the rattling gourd with pebbles in it to pieces and outbraves even death itself. The women make a furious onset with their burning torches, his pain is soon so excruciating that he rushes out from the pole, with the fury of the most savage beast of prey, and with the vine sweeps down all before him, kicking, biting, and trampling them with the greatest despite. The circle immediately fills again, either with the same or fresh persons. They attack him on every side. Now he runs to the pole for shelter, but the flames pursue him. Then, with champing teeth and sparkling eyeballs, he breaks through their contracted circle afresh and acts every part that the highest courage, most raging fury, and blackest despair can prompt him to. But he is sure to be overpowered by numbers, and after some time the fire affects his tender parts. Then they pour over him a quantity of cold water and allow him a proper time of respite, till his spirits recover and he is capable of suffering new tortures. Then the like cruelties are repeated till he falls and happily becomes insensible of pain. Now they scalp him, in the manner before described, dismember and carry off all the exterior branches of the body, pudendis non acceptus, in shameful and savage triumph. This is the most favorable treatment their devoted captives receive. It would be too shocking to humanity either to give or peruse every particular of their conduct in such doleful tragedies. Nothing can equal these scenes but those of the merciful Romish Inquisition. Not a soul, of whatever age or sex, manifests the least pity during the prisoners' tortures. The women sing with religious joy, all the while they are torturing the devoted victim, and peals of laughter resound through the crowded theater, especially if he fears to die. But a warrior puts on a bold, austere countenance and carries it through all his pains. As long as he can, he whoops and outbraves the enemy, describing his martial deeds against them, and those of his nation, whom he threatens will force many of them to eat fire in revenge of his fate, as he had often done to some of their relations at their cost. Though the same things operate alike upon the organs of the human body, and produce a uniformity of sensations, weakness, or constancy of mind derived from habit helps greatly to heighten or lessen the sense of pain. By this, the afflicted party has learned to stifle nature, and show an outward unconcern under such slow and acute tortures, and the surprising cruelty of their women is equally owing to education and custom. Similar instances verify this, as in Lisbon and other places, where tender-hearted ladies are transformed by their bloody priests into so many Medeas through deluded religious principles, and sit and see with the highest joy the martyrs of God, drawn along in diabolical triumph to the fiery stake, and suffering death with lingering tortures.